evening. I'm Helga Janssen Dalbia, and welcome to Democracy in Action, the show where we help you understand and respond to issues affecting you and your community. It's been called the greatest shame in our society, gender-based violence. The presidential, the presidential summit against gender-based violence and femicide calls it a national crisis. Now, the number of women who've experienced gender-based violence between 2015 and 2016 jumped 53%. The murder rate against women in that same year jumped to 117%. It's been characterized and can be seen as a war against South African women. Tonight on Democracy in Action, we discuss the topic of gender-based violence and ask what is the role of society and government, specifically the Department of Justice, in protecting the most vulnerable in our society, women. But before we do, let's take a look at how global communities are responding to the scourge. Dignity is the idea that all humans have value. This means you are worthy of respect simply because you are a human. Our constitution recognizes that everyone has dignity and the right to have it protected. Because when dignity isn't respected, people are abused and treated as less than human and their self-worth is undermined. This frequently happened to people of color during colonialism and apartheid through abuses like forced removals of people from areas where they had lived for generations, as happened to Patty Orenser, whose family were forcibly removed from Simonstown in the Western Cape in 1969 after it was declared a whites-only area. We were reading the paper that Simonstown has been declared white. I don't think anybody can imagine how we sat in the train going to work that morning. When it comes to Heritage Day and you walk through the town and you remember who lived here and who lived there, but it's all changed. You couldn't fight them. You either go or you, if you protest, they would have locked you up for 90 days. Our dignity was shattered. You had nothing. You had absolutely nothing whatsoever. <laughs> It was heartbreaking, it was so, it was heartbreaking. Dignity isn't only a right in the Constitution, it is one of the core values on which South Africa is built. Rights, like your freedom to think, whatever you wish, go wherever you want, associate with whomever you like, and say whatever you want, are all based on the values of dignity, equality, and freedom, the core values of our country. One of the biggest threats to dignity in modern South Africa is poverty. 55% of South Africans live in poverty. These people face a range of conditions that threaten their dignity, like hunger, inadequate sanitation and shelter, and many others. The Constitution includes socioeconomic rights to try to ensure that people have adequate living conditions. Another way someone's dignity is threatened is when they are threatened with violence. Across the world, women face challenges to their dignity based on terrible levels of violence against them. In South Africa, one in five women over the age of 18 has experienced physical violence. Members of the LGBTQI plus communities also suffer higher levels of violence, which undermines their self-worth. No matter who you are or what you have done, you deserve to be treated with dignity. It is a right you can expect of others and they can expect of you. If you feel that the conditions that you live in or the way people treat you undermines your dignity, there are organizations like the South African Human Rights Commission or the Commission for Gender Equality that you can contact who will help you enforce your rights. Welcome back. You're watching Democracy in Action. We're talking gender-based violence. And with us in studio is Lucinda Evans, director of, and let me get this right, Pelisa Abafazi Betu, and gender activist based in the Lavender Hill area. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, Lucinda, gender-based violence is, as we saw um, in the footage of, 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 of the video earlier, is one of the biggest scourges, not only of South African society, but around the world. Describe to us what the condition of gender-based violence and how people are responding to it in the area where you work. Um, thank you, Helga, for having me here. It, it's war. And a lot of people don't understand 
when somebody like myself in the area where I work and the services that we provide, not just to Lavendale, but the broader community, that they are war on women, they are war on our bodies, and they are also war on our vaginas. Um, we have seen in the last three years the epidemic proportions of women coming to report at our organization versus not wanting to report at the police and that is for for many various reasons some of the cases or most of the cases women say that you know when they come there and they report the police will tell them to come back the next day or they are drunk or they don't present well or go back home we also find that when women do come with protection orders that some of the officers is not able to read the protection order or action the protection order and so as an organization that has been advocating for the last 11 years for the protection of women, we have also seen that the systems that are in place that is supposed to provide protection for women is flawed. The implementation of that system, it is flawed. And the protectors that are supposed to protect us, which is one is the South African Police Service, the second one is the Department of Justice, is also failing us. You, there are a number of issues that you've raised now, but the one that really stands out is that police officers, which is the first port of call, if, 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 if something happens to me, I go to the police station, they're not able to read the protection order. What is that telling us about the level of training um, for police officers or, or the police station to respond to um, a, a survivor who's coming to report? One of the things that we had to do as an organization way back when, we had our endless fights. We've opened up so many cases against police officers. We had to change our thinking around how can we work with this institution that is the number one responder or the number one protector. So it cost us to, to offer our services where we have actually provided additional training to two of the police stations that we work very close to. We are still questioning the level of training that is happening at the college versus what the police officers should action. If this training of gender-based violence, we don't know what the content is, is from way back when, 30 years and more, and what police officers have to deal with now, they are not equipped, number one, to deal with how do I enforce the law. As an organization, we are saying there is a national instruction that gives clear guidelines in terms of what do you do when women report violence. There is action steps that needs to be taken. And in addition, she comes with a document from court, a protection order, whether it's an interim order, whether it's a finalized order, and the order is very specific. But we still find in some of the stations that we have police officers that when she brings the document, language number one is a challenge for some of these officers. Number two, some of them do not understand what they need to do, although this document is very specific. And so we need to advocate and say, and take it to the public domain and challenge the current training module that police officers, when they go for the one year training around domestic violence, how do they adequately enforce the law and do their job. I just want to, to pause there for a moment and just come back to, now to let our viewers also know that we had invited the Department of Justice and we had invited SAPS. Unfortunately, they weren't able to join us at this time. But I just want to come back to, to, to the training. In your opinion and in your experience, um, we've just had a budget. Uh, uh, um, in February, the, the Minister of Treasury submitted their budget to the public. Um, and there was talk that, they were, that the Department of Justice and, and police um, services had not given adequate funding for gender-based violence training. What is your response to that? And I, is this I can true? imagine. I can imagine if we just look at what the 150 stations we have in the Western Cape. In the police station, there is a victim-friendly room. The people in the townships know it and everywhere as the VEP room. Mm. As an activist, our understanding of that VEP service is that when a 
survivor of gender-based violence, whether it's male or female, arrive at the police station, the law bit or the law services needs to happen. But that psychosocial services also needs to happen. And simultaneously. Simultaneously, yes. And obviously from the VEP room, there needs to be containment and referral. Now, if you go around in the province and you go in that particular room, that particular service that has to be there, you will find that there are no VEP personnel manning or personing that VEP room. And my question that I'm asking tonight is why? When this is also part of the national instruction that together with the law services, the psychosocial service needs to be available, who is accountable? Who do we keep accountable that that VEP room is not personnel 24 hours? Number two, if the budget has not been used adequately, why are we not having stipend um, EPWP people that are manning or personing that room? Number three, who is responsible and who do we keep accountable? And who do I need to write to as an activist to say that it is an indictment? It's an indictment to the communities. We have this horrific, horrific stats. It's out there in the domain that what happens to women, hence the service is not available. So I just want to, for, for our viewers who may have just joined us, what you describe now, I've come to the police station, there is a, there is a trauma room that is not being personnel adequately. There's a police um, man or woman who's there who may, may or may not understand what needs to be done at a protection order phase. Um, but after maybe two or three hours, I find them able to lay a charge. I'm going to court now. Do, what is your experience of now taking um, and through your program, the court support um, program that you've got at your organization, you are escorting me now to court. What happens at court? Can you describe to us what the experience would be? Um, I'm 23 years old, I've been abused by my intimate partner and now I'm at court. What happens? So one of the services, so we, let's say for an example, the client doesn't have a protection order. So in many cases, in many, many cases. And we work in partnership with the police, and this is no knocking of the police service mm -hmm. in any sense. Some of those police officers would not open up the case and say, you need to get a protection order. And that is wrong. When she comes there and she's been abused. And so one of the other things that police officers also look for is the physical stuff. The blue eye, the broken lip, the broken arm. The, those are the physical things. But how do you prove emotional abuse? How do you prove stalking? How do you prove harassment? And so these are some of the, the flaws in the system. And now the police officer says, you need to go and get a protection order. And that is how clients end up on our doorstep. So what we do is, and unfortunately, we don't have funding to do it for all women. So it is specialized. I don't even want to use the word specialized. It's, it's cruel. It's a priority case where we understand when she walks in and she tells us, if I go home, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I have nowhere to go. I'm going to die when I go back home. That we will toss one of our volunteers to go with her to court where she has to make that protection order. And over the years, we have built up a relationship with three of the courts that even if we come two o'clock in the afternoon, that service will be rendered to her. Because there have been ex um, examples of where women have gone, have not been able to get the order, have yes. gone home, and have been either re-abused or yes. even killed. Yes, There have been those and, instances. And, and we've had some cases where, I mean, over the years, myself and my placard and my voice, and, and, it, and it's been hard work to get to the point where even now at court, when they are not able to give the order. And unfortunately, I have to say, it is only Weinberg Court that provides the service because of the relationship and Simon's Town Court that we will get a call from the court to say, can you please overnight the client in your emergency safe house? But that, that's again dependent on the relationship it's that civil society organizations such as yourselves can build with We've, um, court officials. We've built it, and we've built it, and it's been hard work. Mm. It's been, it's been love hate. It's been 
going back to the table. It's, it was advocacy. It was name and shame campaigns. It was demanding meetings. Mm. It was literally sit-ins mm. until the understanding came that we want to work in partnership. We know our mandate and we know our lane. And so when the client gets the interim order, we will go back to the police station. And within 24 to 48 hours, that interim has to be served on the perpetrator. Now that too has become a problem for most women, that if they don't have a police Abu Fazi backup, the physical person next to the client who is escorting her at the police station, you will find in some cases that that order that interim order hasn't been served in a week. Mm. And now for an example, if it's a priority case and she has a court date within five days, because for priority cases, the court to one to seven days, there will be the protection order hearing that we find in some cases, some of these orders have not been served. I just want to come back to the, the special relationship. Now we know that in late March, President Ramaphosa had um, officially opened the Boysons Sexual Offences Court up in Gauteng. Um, we also know that South Africa is a forerunner in the establishment of these special offences or the Sexual Offences Court across the world. The model's been replicated. Yet in the Western Cape, Lucinda, tell us what the situation of these courts are in the Western Cape because they are not new. We mustn't think that just because there was a launch in Boysons, this was a new court. There are courts like this in Mitchell's Plain. Tell us about that. I know that the court was burnt or something. It was. Yeah. It was. And and again, for us, it's a it's it's a bit sweet. You know, the launch of the Boysons Court, and as an activist in Lavendale in the Deep South, my question to this would be: Thank you very much that there is a court. But when are we going to fast track specialized cases or priority cases? We find in femicide and even the 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 murder of children that. Some of these cases drag from one to three to four years because of issues of DNA, that the postponement, postponement, postponement of cases is sometimes that the DNA is not ready. And one has to wait completely long for the DNA. And again, when it comes back to budget, what are the budget attached to the forensics? Why do some of us or some of the cases that we've been following that we've almost waited two to three months for DNA? And this is re-traumatizing a family. Imagine my daughter was brutally raped and murdered and I have to wait as a parent for two to three months every time I go to court, every time it gets postponed because of the DNA not being there. So Lucinda, that speaks again to a weakness in the infrastructure and in this institutional in infrastructure in our, in our system and that we, we have to address this as civil society. But we'll come back to the conversation after this break. Don't go away. Gender-based violence is still a serious issue and it's affecting one in four women in South Africa. Now we will be back with Helga in studio but for now we've, we have the uh, Provincial Coordinator for Gender-Based Violence and Victim Empowerment, Lieutenant Colonel Paulson who is with us in studio, who will be telling us more about um, uh, SAPS, uh, their work that they do when it comes to gender-based violence. Welcome sir. Uh, let's step into it. So the first question I have for you is, if women experience gender-based violence, which includes physical violence or sexual assault, what does the reporting process look like? Should, should they choose to lay a case? Okay, normally in any type of case, uh, should it be a physical one or a sexual offences case, your first reporting call would normally would be your police station, they call it your community service centre, or it can be a call that is dispatched to a patrol vehicle where uh, patrol van has to attend to the complaint or when somebody phones into a police station and the member answering the phone needs to attend to that particular complaint. So when the person reports to a police station, normally they will be interviewed in the community service centre in terms of finding out in terms of why is the client at the station. So there is a determination that is taking place in terms of why the person reports to the police station. 
Should it be that it is a domestic violence case or any sexual offences case? The member in the community service centre, normally called our frontline staff members, they would then take the person to a victim-friendly room. Victim-friendly room is a room located at all of our police stations where a victim with a sensitive case like domestic violence or sexual offences will be seen separately from your general public that would report at the police station. And what is less well known is that once a case is laid, the victim of violence becomes a witness. What, is, what does RAW entail with regard to investigation done by police? Okay, once there's a, a determination in terms of why the person is there, what takes place in the victim-friendly room is your initial debriefing. Initial debriefing is normally conducted either by a police official or a volunteer that is working for the police station in terms of victim support. Based on that initial debriefing, um, we look at the victim's immediate needs. If the need is that the victim wants to open a case or lay a, uh, a complaint, then a statement is taken from that particular victim in private. Um, before that also is also the initial briefing looking in terms of what is the physical needs in terms of the victim. Now the victim has certain rights when they do report to a police station. The first right would be our members need to treat the victim with dignity and respect. Second one would be in terms of receiving information from that particular victim and also giving that inform uh, victim information. Then also in terms of also make sure that the victim is protected and that the victim also receives the necessary uh, assistance in terms of practical assistance, uh, emotional support, or in terms of if the case is late, if there is a need for counseling to be referred to a service provider that can assist that particular victim with that type of counseling. But once that victim becomes a, a witness in that particular, not the, wit the, the victim will normally be the complainant. So in terms of the complaint, um, after the initial reporting, the re after the reporting phase, kicks in the investigating phase. So the case would be then referred to a detective or a specialized unit, uh, say for instance in the, in the case of sexual offenses to the family violence, uh, children, child protection and sexual offenses unit, which is normally called our FCS. And then that particular victim will then get the necessary attention from that particular detective in terms of what is the name of the investigating officer, the case number, and if it's one of our sensitive cases, like I just mentioned, the victim will then be taken to either a, to, to the Zella Care Center, especially when it's a sexual offenses case, where the whole process will be conducted in terms of the investigation at that particular health facility. And then the victim will continuously be updated in terms of the progress of that particular case. And then also in terms of what future court days it will be for that particular victim. And also in, in terms of your question, in terms of witnesses, if there is any other witnesses that needs to be interviewed by that detective that would be a witness to that complaint for that particular victim. Now, we know any type of violence is a traumatic, uh, traumatic event. What support system exists at the police stations to help victims navigate the initial stages of reporting and laying um, charges of assault? Okay. The type of assistance that we are mandated to give to our victims is to make sure that each of our police stations have a victim-friendly room. Our victim-friendly rooms is manned by our police officer, officials as well as victim support volunteers that is trained by our civil society organizations like uh, FAMSA, NICRO, and Rape Crisis. And also within that particular uh, victim-friendly room, also our members are trained in terms of victim empowerment, domestic violence, uh, first responded to sexual offenses and vulnerable groups. So the victim will receive at our police station separately from your general public uh, victim support in terms of practical assistance, uh, emotional support, um, also in terms of a referral to a relevant service provider that can assist with the victim with further counseling. So those services is available at our police stations to assist victims of crime. And we know that many women are often reluctant to report violence for fear of not being believed or being turned away. What is your advice to women or anyone that is afraid to report these cases? Okay, in terms of that, uh, my advice to those victims is that they shouldn't be afraid. Um, if they don't want to report, report to somebody that they trust, report to a friend, and also request that particular person they report to to assist them through the process in terms of reporting. But 
any crime that is underreported or not reported also plays in the hand of our perpetrators out there so that we don't have a real sense or in terms of what is the crimes that is perpetrated against women if they do not report. Uh, we can assure in terms of the reporting that the police would assist in terms of the reporting phase as well as in the event investigating phase. Should the victim be not happy with our services, there's also a recourse in terms of identifying that particular member that did not uh, give the victim the necessary service they deserve and that we can also deal with those particular members in terms of not giving a service as we are promoting, we re render services to our victims. So the victims should never be afraid to report the crime. It's actually best if they do report so that we can have a sense in terms of what is the rate of crime perpetrated against uh, women and children, and especially in terms of gender-based violence. And in the case of the community, um, when neighbors witness violence, they are reluctant to get involved. From your perspective, should they get involved and call the police? Okay, all calls, especially neighbors that is uh, witnessing abuse, can also be uh, uh, reported to us anon anon uh, anonymously. So they, even, they don't have to give their name, but there will then be an initial state or a reaction from the police in terms of the call that has been received. So that the police can at least investigate uh, the origin, uh, the origin from, from the crime and also make a turn at the scene where uh, the crime is, re is reported from. So that in itself is also a deterrent, uh, also a, 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 a help to the victim in terms of what we don't see that the neighbors already have witnessed. So that is also giving us the go ahead to investigate further if there is such a complaint of any uh, physical abuse or any uh, crime that has been committed that could not be reported by the victim herself or himself. Would like to thank Lieutenant Colonel Paulson for joining us today. Uh, we're heading back to studio with Helga. Thanks. Welcome back. You're watching Democracy in Action. Lucinda, we saw there from the Voxes that Cape Townians know what gender-based violence is. They know that it's an, that it's, it's an issue in their communities. You've established a campaign called Hands Off My Vagina. Tell us about this campaign. It's quite provocative because I know that it's also been translated into Afrikaans um, and that it's quite a provocative word. So tell us why, why this? You know, it's an interesting thing that you say that we all know about gender-based violence, but we have become so desensitized about gender-based violence that as a community, Ach, it's just another fight. Ach, it's just, oh, they're, they're, she's screaming again. Oh, the children are crying again. And as an organization, we were very shocked and hearted that the movement, there is no real movement from communities to action. And so in October of last year, our organization was invited to a march, 4th of October, where communities came together and they spoke about gang violence. But nobody looks gender-based violence and gang violence in the same context. We understand that because when there are no active shooting, we see the rate of reported cases of assault, sexual assault, young girls that have... Oh, well, uh, you, uh, explain that part to me. Are you saying that when there's, when there's a lull in gang violence, there's an escalation in gender-based violence? Active shooting. And so in our understanding and what we have monitored and seen and reported cases is that rape is being used as one form of gang initiation. And so we've been watching the rates of assault, the rates of rape, and also when these young girls disappear, 13, 14, 15 year olds. So we wanted, and it was intentional, we wanted Cape Town to really look at violence against women and children. And I used a placard with the township word for vagina. It has sent ripples of shock through the province and as far up as I believe some people in New Zealand have seen the video. But we are so focused on the word, the P word that was on the poster, 
that we forgot the actual issue has always been violence against our vagina. Mm. So yes, I've been labeled as a barbaric woman, and but we forget about the barbarism that is currently happening to our vaginas, whether the vagina is a baby of a month old or a granny that is 99 years old. We forget that the issue is the fact that there is genocide on our vaginas. And a lot of people are saying, you cannot w use the word genocide. And I say, as an activist, we use the word genocide because inside, for the women that has been sexually violated, she's dead. She's feeling dead. If somebody has, and a young girl, and an oma, and an auntie, and a mother, if somebody has violated your vagina in a way that you haven't given the person permission, you never said yes. It was violent. It was vile. And what about women that have been raped when they were children and raped when they were adults? So our Hands of Our Vagina campaign that we started 4th of October 2018. For us, it needs to be 365 days of advocating for the protection of our vaginas. We have taken it a notch further that I put my T-shirt on and I walked into Parliament. And I walked into Parliament with intention. And the intention was that I wanted, number one, the 99% men that has to make these decisions around the protection of my vagina and my daughter's vagina and the sister on the farm's vagina and the sister in the township's vagina. I wanted them to see that it's still an injury to one vagina is an injury to all our vaginas. It's a, it's a known slogan. I just want to, it, it is indeed provocative and it does make people sit up. Um, and, the, and, 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 and at least the word has gotten the conversation going. Yes. But I just wanted to come back to uh, um, one part of your campaign, um, and we spoke about this during the break, um, about the monetization of our vaginas. Absolutely. It's actually worth only 500 rand. It's 500 rand. Yes, explain that part. The, the, and so, and, and, and yes, we have a beautiful constitution. And I wish I had the ability and pro bono lawyers that we could take, I want to take as a gender activist, I want to take the constitution to the constitutional court. Because if a woman is raped and the constitution says everyone has a right to a fair trial, 500 rand is the value of my vagina because tomorrow he's out on bail. And we have seen many cases of rapists that have raped come out on 500 rand bail and re-raped again. We have seen in cases where they were out on 500 rand bail and perpetrated one to three more crimes. So what is the value of our vaginas in this country? Is it 500 rand? Is it 1,500 rand? And that's the question, the burning question. The thing that still motivates me to jump out of bed and put the word vagina in 12 derogatory words in the nine languages in our country, including sign language. It motivates me to walk into national parliament and sit at the standing portfolio committee for safety with the word derogatory word on my back. And in front it says, an injury to one vagina is an injury to all our vaginas. It motivates me to take it to that level where we want to evoke and to shock. Because, let's be honest, we have beautiful laws that protects us, so-called laws. The implementation of this is flawed. The political will to really move, to criminalize these rapists, is flawed. It is still where we go one to three years to a rape trial before there's justice. And what is justice? 15 years and on good behavior, he's out on eight. Is that justice? Is it 25 years because he's a first offender and he gets 15? Is that justice? So what you're describing in fact is that despite um, the, the rigors of our constitution, 
the, the, the human rights approaches to our constitution within the implementation of the system, it is as if women are being re-raped, re -abused. Absolutely. I just want to come back to the, to the campaign. I think, um, and particularly for our viewers, it would be very interesting to know how the community responded to this and what were some of the positives that came out of such a provocative campaign. I mean, I can imagine you walking into Parliament with this T-shirt on that says, May pee as ni. You know, how you, how you hand up and may pee up, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, it was very interesting because I thought I wasn't going to have access to Parliament because the T-shirt was strategically printed the main message was on my back. Mm. So I could easily pass security and somebody read the uh, injury to one vagina, the injuries to all her vaginas. But at the back of my t-shirt, it says, lost my and the P word mm. of. Mm. And when you are raped, somebody's not going to say, I want to touch your, your, your vagina. It is, it is ugly, it is, it is brutal. What this people, this person say to survivors, so the backlash, and there has been backlash from the community, mm. from the religious sectors. People were angry that I would use such a word. There were backlash from women activists to say, how can you? How can you brutalize? And there were survivors that said, thank you for giving my vagina a voice. I had many, many inboxes on my Facebook pages and WhatsApp messages to say, you know what, I couldn't report the case because it was my word against his word. But thank you for saying that my vagina matters. Thank you for saying it as it is. It had to be said a long time ago. So what, just come again, you, you say that the, the religious community was up in arms, um, ordinary women in the community was up in arms, but survivors were the ones who said thank you. Where is the campaign now? The campaign where we are at the moment is we are still raising awareness. Mm -hmm. We want to take this campaign a notch further and challenge the South African Police Service. We want victim empowerment, EPWP, stipend paid personnel in those rooms. It is a priority. It is a priority if the president is saying and he signed the declaration. And I, I, as a community activist, what does that mean for me? I wanted to ask you what exactly, what the presidential summit and what the declaration means for activists like you. What does it mean for mm. me? Are we going to hold people accountable that didn't spend their budget, that could have spent their budget to adequately personnel the victim empowerment rooms? Are we going to keep people accountable that at the police training college, the training should be on par with the realities that are out there. What does that declaration mean for me? Does it mean that we don't need to go to court for the next three years and that a rape case can be concluded in less than a year? Does it mean that DNA results, we can expect them within 21 days other than three months? And I want to cite a case for you that we are following. Marysburg is a town which is at the end of nowhere. And in November of 2018, a 14-year-old girl was found in a home with adults. The inside of her jeans was perfectly cut open and she's been raped. It is now April. The parents have been told that they are still waiting on the DNA results to facilitate an arrest. What does that tell us in relation to we are going to the elections. Is the vagina the priority on all of these political parties, manifestos? I, I threw something out on Facebook and I just asked the question, how many of these political parties have a sexual harassment policy in their own organizations, in their own parties? It is shameful. Was, it is shameful. Was there any response from any political party? At, at, apparently there's only two from the hundred and whatever. So what does that say about prioritizing the issues of the vagina? Mm. People are focused on the P word, forgetting what the issue is really about. Lucinda, I just want to come back to tactics, um, campaigning tactics. So we, as you've noted, we've gone into an election, we're going into an election season. 
The president has been everywhere, on Twitter, on Facebook, on, on trains that go nowhere. Um, he's been everywhere. How can communities harness the moment that we are in to forward campaigns such as um, Keep My Vagina Safe? You know, I wish we had a women's party <laughs> that would have contested the elections. I mean, if you look at, if you just drive around in Cape Town, how many women's faces is standing for presidential candidates? How many? How many women's faces is on billboards that are premier candidates? So for us as women, we have a long way to go. We really have a long way to go. And we know what we know in relation to women are still being treated as second class citizens in this country. Mm. Although the constitution gives us equality, in reality, in reality, there's no such thing. There's no equity and there is no equality, and there is war on our vaginas. Listen, I want to say thank you so much for being with us on Democracy in Action, um, and we wish you all the best with your campaign, and we look forward to having you back with us. And thank you to you for watching Democracy in Action. Till next time, from me, Haldi Anton Davia, and the crew right here on Cape Town TV. Till next time. When abuse occurs in situations of trust, whether in the family, whether in the church, in the schools of our nation, or elsewhere, the sense of betrayal is indeed intensified. The physical and psychological effects may look like they are receding, but they very rarely disappear. One moment of violence can have permanent consequences on the lives of women. Most of us can testify to the fact that we know someone who is a survivor, a survivor of gender-based violence, or who has in some way or other been affected by the heinous crimes that are committed against the women of our country. But what I have found is that these summits and conferences and meetings do give us an opportunity, an opportunity to be able to talk to one another and to listen to one another. They give us an opportunity to listen to the stories of the women who sat here, who quietly told their story in a harrowing way and who reduced quite a number of us to tears as they related the deep pain that they feel and as they related how their lives have been shattered at the hands of men. Now the proposals that have been put forward here are definitely proposals that we are going to act on. We have it within us from re-looking at how our budget is constructed right through to even setting up the structure to deal with gender-based violence. So what the women of our country are saying is not landing on deaf ears.